some interesting things about the brain, how it works, and why it's really important uh, to your whole life. You may know this, this quote in another context, it's a quote from Carl Sagan that I've doctored a bit, that the key point here in this is that the brain is the most important thing that there is in the universe of humans. Almost nobody knows anything about it, and almost nobody knows how it develops. But I'm going to do today is to try and tell you a little bit about that and see if we can understand our health in middle age. Now, one of the key parts of the brain is the frontal lobe. And as a frontal lobe show this, I've been studying frontal lobe functions since uh, 1970s for quite a while. Um, we still don't know how it works. But one of the key things is that there are many parts. The, the, all the parts don't really matter, except that the part right at the front, which is called the prefrontal cortex, and if you think about it, it's a ridiculous term. That means in front of the front. How can you be in front of the front? Anyway, that's the term. So it's this very front stuff that's, uh, you can see there, it's called dorsal lateral orbital and whatnot. Now, that's the brain's executive. So this is the, the reason of the brain that coordinates everything you do, plans, what you're going to have for breakfast, it plans what you're going to do tomorrow, it keeps track of things as you're going along, and so on. And there are several interesting things about the prefrontal cortex, but one of them is that it's exquisitely sensitive to experience. And so, if you think about it, experience has involved everything. It involves drugs, it involves uh, whether they're legal drugs or illicit drugs, it involves stress, social interactions, lots of things. And I'll give you a few examples. It's very, the prefrontal cortex is very slow to develop. It starts in utero, but it continues until 35 years of age. So a lot of things can affect how it actually functions. So we need to say a little bit about we need to say a little bit about um, the development of the frontal lobes and of the brain itself. So the brain is unlike other organs in that you simply could not have a blueprint to build a brain. It's way too complicated. Uh, in an adult brain, there are about 100 billion brain cells, neurons. Uh, more than that, in support cells. And there are about 10 to the 14th connections. You couldn't actually have something designed in advance like that. So how would you do it? How would you actually go about doing this? Well, if you think about Michelangelo, when he was making the Statue of David, what did he do? He started with a big block of stone, and he had chisels, and got rid of half of it. And so Mother Nature said, Work for Michelangelo, it's going to work for the brain. So what happens is, you start with twice as much brain when you're born as you need to get rid of half of it. You build twice as many connections in the first few years of life as you need, and you get rid of half of them. And it's this getting rid of stuff that determines who you are and what it is you can do. So this figure shows the development on the left-hand axis is essentially a surrogate of the number of connections. So you can see at birth, that the number of connections has gone up from conception, but it keeps going up. And there's two lines there. The top line is the uh, visual cortex, the stuff at the back of the brain, and the bottom line is the prefrontal cortex. So the visual cortex reaches its peak around two years of age, holds off for a bit, then starts getting rid of connections. The prefrontal cortex doesn't do that. It reaches its peak at between five and 10 years, depending on which region it is, it waits for a while, and then around 10 years of age, just before adolescence or, or puberty, you start getting rid of connections. And the rate you get rid of those connections is phenomenal. If you think about a 14-year-old girl, which is probably a time which you can see a lot of changes going on, they're not always the most pleasant group to be around. Uh, those of us who are parents can relate to that, I think. Um, and what happens is that you're losing, at that time, 100,000 connections per second. So 100,000 are gone. 100,000 are gone, 100,000 are gone, and what's driving that? Hormones are driving that, and experiences. So what happens is we start losing these at a rapid rate, but it doesn't stop in adolescence. It continues on, and we've now learned that it continues on well into the 30s. When I was 25, I thought I was an adult. I had just got a PhD, and I was a hot shot. I could write my own ticket to nowhere, and it turns out I wasn't an adult at age 25, and if I look back, I really wasn't who I am today until I was about 35, when my frontal lobes stopped growing, then started dying. <laughs> so, the key thing here is that when you're pruning, there's good pruning and bad pruning. So, just like pruning a tree, you can destroy a tree if you don't know what you're doing, you can destroy a brain if you prune the cells incorrectly. So, experiences have to throw away connections, but they've got to throw them away in a logical way that's going to give you good function. Play 
is one of the chisels that changes the brain. So you can see in the picture there, there are rats playing and there are uh, children playing, all mammals play, and there are rules. If you're a rat, the rules are pretty straightforward. I'm gonna try and nuzzle the back of your neck, and you're gonna try and prevent me. And we're gonna take turns. I'll try, you try. The effect of this is they sort of roll around, and we call it popcorning. It's like popcorn going up and down. If you've watched kittens play, it's exactly the same thing. Kittens have this rolling behavior. They're trying to nuzzle the nape of the neck. Children, of course, play differently, but the rules are, are similar. Reciprocity, I get to do something to you, you get to do something to me. So why is this important? Well, it turns out that play modifies prefrontal development. So the more play you have, play is a form of problem solving, the more play you have, the more you change that frontal lobe for the better. One of the things that happens is that play makes the brain more changeable later in life. So the more play you've had as a, as a child and an adolescent, the more flexible your brain is later in life because of this problem-solving aspect. And if you think about children who don't get a chance to play, we're messing with their brain. They really need this play activity, not just rough and tumble, but other forms of play as well. So there's one example. Another example is the opposite kind of thing, and that is prenatal stress. So if you're stressed in utero, your mom is stressed because she's broke, she's pregnant, um, your, your dad's a jerk, all the possibilities that could cause the stress in, in your mom, it turns out that it alters the way in which your frontal lobe develops, and in this case, it's bad pruning. So you can see in that picture on the, on the uh, left, you can see a nice neuron, a nice cell, and we've got a blow up on the right of just one bit of that cell, and the section on the left of the right is a normal looking bit, lots of connections on it. The bit on the right you can see is miserable looking, it's bad pruning. So the effect of this is that you end up with cognitive problems in adulthood, motor problems in adulthood, so you're clumsy, for example. Social problems, all kinds of problems. Proneness to addiction, all sorts of issues because of this prenatal stress. Wasn't well, your fault, just happened while you were in utero. So what, you might say? Well, the, the key point here is that the uh, structure of the prefrontal region is altered by these early experiences and then it doesn't respond the same way later. So if you've had a lot to play, that's a good thing. You respond in a particular way. If you've not, um, then you don't. Similarly, if you've had this prenatal stress, your brain doesn't respond the same way. Okay. A guy by the name of Vincent Fillet came up with this term, uh, turning gold into lead, and I love it, because it follows what I've just said. What he did is he had a, an obesity clinic in California, and he noticed that people coming into his clinic all had a story. A story about things that happened to them as children. And he began to keep track of this. He then did a study with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and they now have over 170,000 people in their study. And what they've discovered is that ACEs, aversive childhood experiences, are very common. And these early experiences uh, add up. Okay, so the more you have, the bigger the effect is going to be, and it affects your health in middle age. So 50 years later, it affects your health. You can see here, it's not just your mental health, although that's clearly a big part of it, it affects physical health. So people are more prone to heart attack, to diabetes, but also to mental issues such as depression, addiction, and so on. If you've had two or more of those ACEs during development, you're 50 times more likely to be a drug addict. If you've had two or more of those ACEs and you're a female at age 50, you're five times more likely to suffer a sexual assault. Why would that be? Well, in the case of the sexual assault, you're not evaluating the situation uh, correctly. You're not reading things. Don't see the danger because your frontal lobe is supposed to do that. It didn't form correctly. Now, one of the key things about being healthy is literacy. And the uh, OECD has defined literacy as the capacity basically to read. And so what it's done is to try and relate literacy to health. And what I'm going to tell you is development of the prefrontal cortex is linked to literacy. So, if you look in Canada, there, there, the OECD has a, a literacy scale from one to five. One is the lowest, five is the highest. 50% roughly of the population of Canada and the United States are at levels one and two. This is functionally illiterate. So what you've got is people who cannot really understand a prescription, they can't understand consent forms that their kids might bring home from the school and so on. In, in Sweden, it's only 30%. Well, why is that? Are the Swedes so much smarter? No. The Swedes pour money into early child development. People must take a year's um, um, maternity leave. 
the United States it's very short, in Canada it's a little longer, but it's not, it's not a year. They also pour resources into setting up programs for young children. So, what does literacy do? What does low literacy do to people? One thing is that it shifts people's and limits people's opportunities. Low literacy leads to greater stress. And we have this myth of the person who's most stressed is the executive sitting in some tower somewhere directing this huge corporation. And I'm willing to submit to you that the guy working at McDonald's who is functionally illiterate is more stressed than the, than the executive, and the data bear that out. Literacy is related to health. You have a shorter life expectancy if you have low literacy, you have more accidents, more cancer, more heart disease, and so on. And finally, literacy makes it difficult to assess parenting materials and actually to um, affect your children's learning. Here's an example of the effect of uh, literacy on, on development. We talk about trajectories. So the study done in which at 36 months, these authors looked at the vocabulary of children and discovered there were three groups. There was a group that at 36 months had about 400 words and another group that had about 1,200 words and then one in between. Huge difference. They then asked, what happens at age 10? So at age 10, they came back and looked at the same kids and discovered the kids who had the 1,200 word vocabulary had a bigger vocabulary than the mums of the low vocabulary kids. Has a huge impact. So what you've got here is a trajectory the kids are on, and that trajectory is going to determine their literacy later in life. It's correlated with socioeconomic status, but it's not, it's not tightly tied to that. Now, Cuba is really interesting. Cuba, I'm not a communist, I've never been to Cuba, but Cuba has something that, you, that UNESCO and the OECD has discovered it is a key to healthy brains. Castro was interested in children, and he set up programs in which children, once you're, uh, you're, you're pregnant, not the child, the mom's pregnant, um, then you, that's a whole other issue, once, once the mom's pregnant, <laughs> she must go once a month to this polyclinic. And this polyclinic is attached to schools. So all the pregnant moms are going together, they start interacting, they talk about parenting, and there are, there are materials presented there, there's, there's classes for them, and the school is, is a natural progression. So when, when UNESCO went and looked at Cuban kids, at, first of all in grade three and then, and then later, and they've done it at several time points, what they discovered is that in comparison to other Latin American countries, which is that vertical line is the mean uh, for literacy in grade three, you can see that Cuba, which is the poorest of those countries, Chile is the richest, is way out there. Now, before you say, yeah, well, but Canada's way up there too. No, we're not. Canada would be between uh, Chile and uh, Cuba. So the question is, is it something about Cuba or is it something about the programs? So people have actually gone to Mexico, you can see Mexico is the worst, gone to Mexico and set up the Cuban program. What you get, that's what you get, exactly the same thing. So this early experience that, that is not really related to reading directly is affecting the literacy of these kids and they've already told you that the literacy is, is driving your health. So where does this take us? There's several conclusions that I think are, are really apparent. One is that early experience shapes the brain, and especially early experience on the prefrontal cortex affects the brain. The early experience alters developmental trajectories, which affect your life forever. Early experience is related to literacy. It predicts health and happiness. You've got to, to be literate in this world to be, to be healthy, and that happiness goes with it. And finally, the route to literacy and health is through stimulating the prefrontal cortex by investing in early childhood programs. So where does this take us? A key point here, we have a revolution in neuroscience and bio biology and psychology in general. In the 21st century, we've only begun to understand the relationship between these early experiences and later uh, health and happiness. And the implications here for public policy are enormous. We need to convince the people who run the country that they've got to pour resources into these first few years um, to ensure that these kids get a good start and the trajectory is in the right direction. I hope you learned something about your own brain and thanks for listening.